tuberculosis day 2019, which is observed on 24th March every year. Although global efforts to combat tuberculosis have saved an estimated 54 million lives since the year 2000 and reduced TB mortality rate by nearly for almost 42%, TB still remains the world's deadliest infectious killer and takes nearly 4,500 lives every day, despite being preventable and curable. To accelerate the TB response, heads of states had come together and made strong commitments to end tuberculosis by 2030 at the first ever historic UN high-level meeting on TB held last September in New York. This year's World TB Day theme is It's Time. And this theme is to remind the world leaders of the urgency to act on the commitments made by them to build accountability and promote an equitable, rights-based, and people-centric TB response. So let us hear more from our experts on how we can bend the curve sharply to more than double the annual rate of TB decline within the next 21 months or so. We are indeed honored to have with us today two very senior people who have helped shape the fight against tuberculosis. Dr. Mario Rabiglion, Director Global Health Center at the University of Milan and former Director Global TB Program of the WHO. And Dr. Viren Singh Salhotra, who is the additional Deputy Director General at the Central TB Division in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Dr. Salotra has been working for tuberculosis for more than 15 years and carries a lot of experience in TB control program implementation. Representing the community on today's panel is TB survivor and activist Prabha Mahesh. Prabha, Prabha is operations manager at Alert India. She leads by example in empowering people dealing with TB with hope and dignity. Before we hear from our panelists, let us listen to this special World TB Day message, video message from Dr. Teresa Kaseva, Director of the Global TB Program at WHO. Dr. Kaseva could not be present online for this webinar due to prior commitments. Hence, she recorded this video especially for our webinar and sent it to us. So here it is. Dear colleagues and friends, today is World TB Day and WHO jointly with partners and civil society is calling for urgent actions to end TB. We received high level commitments from the heads of states, from the ministers of health, from the civil society. Now it's time to unite forces and put our commitments into the concrete actions. It's time. And today, to support countries to accelerate progress, WHO is launching the package of effective tools. We call them accelerators. In this package, you can find new WHO consolidated guidelines on MDRTB treatment, guidelines on preventive treatment and infection control. We also have uh, two roadmaps, one for ending TB in children and adolescents and another one for more effective engagement of the private sector. And importantly, I would like to attract your attention to the multi-sectoral accountability framework, which was developed according to the request of, of the member states by WHO in consultations with the partners and civil society. And now we have two effective tools for the implementation in the countries of this framework. One is the TB dashboard, can provide uh, the real-time monitoring and strengthening surveillance systems in the countries in general. Another one is uh, tool for the prioritization and planning effective activities based on the patient pathways and cost effectiveness analysis. I would like to highlight two important initiatives. One is WHO flagship initiatives jointly with the Stop TB Partnership and Global Fund Find Treat All. And another one is Civil Society Task Force with the new vision, new engagement and roles for the civil society in new era in the fight against tuberculosis. WHO is committed to lead and coordinate all activities towards ending TB 
and provide engagement of all stakeholders, agencies and civil society. Keeping our promises with this vision, we are announcing the creation of a new global platform for coordination, monitoring and review progress towards ending TB and ask you to join us. Dear friends, but history could be made not only by WHO, partners, donors and civil society. It's about all of us. Look around and you can find a lot of people who need your support. Just give your hand, provide help and explain where they can receive any relevant support, medical care, support during the whole process of treatment. You can do it easily, but you'll be so proud. And because every single life is so important, is unique, and one life plus another one can make happier millions of people affected by TB. Let's do it together. Together, we are stronger. When, if not now, who, if not we? It's time for action. It's time to end TB. Thank you. Thank you for that message, Dr. Kaseva. Yes, together we will do it. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Mario Rebiglion, who headed the Global TB program at the World Health Organization from 20 from 2003 to 2017, and he's currently director, Global Health Center at the University of Milan. Welcome, Mario. Mario, you have invested almost two decades in strengthening TB response globally. Can you tell us why are we failing to bend the curve sharply enough to end TB, and what urgent actions need to be taken to reach the 2020 and 2025 targets set up by the NTG strategy. Over to you. Dear Shoba, thank you very much. And uh, I want to share the screen if I can manage to do it. Yes, uh, I think you have that option to share yep. the screen. Yes. And I need to then open, I mean, the presentation is open, but uh, let's see if I share. Yes, can you share the screen. Yes, yes. But then, uh, where is the sharing? I should get a browser or something. You are sharing your screen. It is showing Zoom written on yep. it. You are sharing the and screen. And so I will have to go down this way, probably, I guess. Let's see. In this just, put, just put on your PPT. Yes, we can see it. Yes. You can, can see it now. Eh? OK, yes, very good. Yes, yes. I have to get out of this. OK, very good. So thank you very much. Uh, Shoba and uh, thank you all the other participants uh, and uh, those who are listening. So it's a great opportunity to greet again the TB community uh, that I keep obviously following and uh, I, I'm just anticipating Shoba that I will need to leave as soon as possible after we finish because there is here Stop TV Italy uh, meeting. I am in Sicily now and uh, to give a talk in the afternoon, so I will have to go to the Congress Center. Is okay. Perhaps That's fine. Are... Yeah. As, uh, yes. As long as you can be there, we'll be very happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm going to use, thank you very much again, I'm going to use some slides that are coming out of the um, Lancet Commission on Tuberculosis, as you see in, uh, in the title page. I was one of the commissioners and the report came out, I believe, a day and a half ago, so it's now public. Uh, and I want to, uh, therefore, make uh, a few points, uh, if I can manage, by starting with uh, the um, reminder of the global burden of the disease. These are the latest WHO estimates. And you see that we are talking 10 million new cases every year and 1.6 million people dying of tuberculosis. If you can count, that is nearly 4,000 every single day. There is no other infectious disease that kills like tuberculosis. And uh, you see that there are more than half a million multidrug resistant cases every year and 1.7 billion people who are latently infected, meaning time bombs uh, to develop tuberculosis unless we do something for them. And uh, by chance, tuberculosis is therefore the number one, number one infectious disease killer and the number 10 
most important cause of that globally, as you see, comparing to all the other diseases, much more than HIV, much more than malaria, much more than any of the new emerging epidemics. Um, TB is everywhere, we know that. There is no single country in the world that has ever eliminated TB. You have on the left the highest burden countries in terms of rates per capita, Africa, Southeast Asia, and you have on the right the percentage. So 44% in Southeast Asia and 18% in the Western Pacific, which is basically China, Philippines, and so on, mean that more than 60% of the cases are in Asia and 25% are in Africa. The rest is as distributed there. And there are now eight countries, meaning two-thirds of all cases, that are uh, in these eight countries. And you see the percentages. In India, it's a quarter plus. In China and Indonesia, each one of them nearly 10%. And then you see Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, South Africa. And so the first message here is we want to eliminate TB. We want to make it accelerate. Then either these countries move more quickly or there would be no way that we can actually achieve the uh, elimination targets and the targets set by the World Health Assembly as part of the end TB strategy. But we have also an additional problem that is that of multidrug resistance. I mentioned it already, more than half a million. And you see in this part of the world, the former Soviet Union, more than two thirds of the cases in some places, uh, one third, sorry, of the cases in some places, 35% in Belarus or in some parts of Russia have this uh, particular problem, have this particular problem. Um, you see here the uh, way the incidence and mortality have uh, gone uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, 15 years. So both of them coming down, incidence and mortality coming down, but very slowly. Incidence at 1.5%, mortality at about 3 to 4%. So we are not really achieving what uh, we are supposed to achieve. Now, the, uh, the um, slides, uh, the next few slides are coming out of the uh, report of the Lancet Commission. So basically the report starts by saying we have a problem. Although 57 million people have been sick and uh, uh, there has been progress, nevertheless uh, in 2017 1.6 million people died of TB and importantly four out of ten people with tuberculosis are not diagnosed and not discovered. Uh, the second important point is that business as usual will not end the epidemic. You see, for instance, the estimates on the left of how many countries will uh, not achieve the mortality uh, decline that has been projected. And for instance, you see on the right that countries such as India or Indonesia will potentially achieve the targets uh, not before next century. We are talking 2024, 2024, 2029. So definitely we have to accelerate this decline. What is uh, uh, the commission saying about the, uh, the uh, challenges? So essentially five challenges. Number one, closing the gap of people being diagnosed and treating. It means reaching all people uh, that, uh, that are uh, out there with tuberculosis. Second point is people-centered response and engagement of civil society communities and affected populations. This is crucial if we want to build a movement perhaps similar to what has been done in HIV AIDS where people are really fully participatory. We don't have that kind of luxury yet in uh, uh, most of the countries. Third, accelerate the development of new tools. We have a problem with the tools that are available uh, uh, and uh, we need to uh, increase resources for research as we need to increase resources for uh, implementation, which is the number four. And finally, accountability. And I think accountability is probably the number one political issue at the moment. Um, now, the next, uh, the next five uh, slides talk about the five priorities and the way to respond to these five priorities. First, the uh, priority number one, patient-centered services to all seeking tuberculosis care. Uh, it means essentially ensuring there are patient-centered services. The patients participate in and contribute in their uh, care. It means at the same time providing what is called universal access to everyone. The second priority, and by the way, this is not a ranking, so it's not the first, it's more important than the second. They're the top five, they're all at the same level. The second priority is reaching high risk people with screening and prevention programs. That is an important point if you want to address the latent infection situation. We have 1.7 billion people latently infected. 
unless we reach the most vulnerable of them, people living with HIV, and the close contacts of people with tuberculosis, we will not stop the reactivation process that is the one that determines the, all these extra cases that we could prevent. The third priority is that of developing, as I said already, new tools, new diagnostics, new therapies, and new vaccines. There is a huge gap in terms of research. Only $700 million are spent annually out of uh, what has been estimated to, to be $2 billion. But I question that number. I never agreed with that number. Because if you just think for a moment of what is happening in the, say, HIV community, the investments are 20 times more. We are talking 10 billion, 20 billion, and that is what we should reach if we want to accelerate the new development of new tools. This is not an issue of reaching the 2 billion. It's an issue of making many billion dollars available so that the best researchers, the best centers are attracted and can actually accelerate. As we have seen in HIV AIDS, no surprise that in HIV AIDS we have 35 antiretrovirals in 30 years. And we have all kinds of point of care tests. And we have all of research that has gone on. Of course, when you invest 20 times more than what is invested today. And number four is the investment of funds, but this in this case we are talking implementation of programs so that the, 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 the all countries can actually uh, accelerate. It's a shared responsibility. We need domestic funding from the BRICS and from the middle income countries now. It's not anymore dependence only on uh, in the, in, in industrialized country support. And we need the donor funding to be focused down on those low-income countries that cannot make it at the moment. But sustainable development means that countries like India, like Brazil, Russia, in, uh, China, and South Africa, for example, need to invest much more of their own domestic funding to make it sustainable on the long run. Until we achieve that level, no way we are going to eliminate B. And finally, priority number five, and this is the accountability issue, that I believe is the most important one. So this uh, Lancet Commission has some proposals. Some people may not agree with all of them, but it means essentially aligning with what was said at the Moscow Ministerial Conference uh, in November 17 and at the uh, UN General Assembly last year in 2018. Building a framework of accountability that is not for health, but is multi-sectoral. And if you ask me where that, what that means, it means going to the highest possible level above the sectors. And that means, in essence, UN General Assembly. It means at the level of seven. It means at the level of the uh, BRICS and the other countries that belong to this category. We need an accountability system that puts on the table what has been achieved or not achieved in all of these countries and what the stakeholders are doing. Because there are perhaps donors that don't do the right thing and they could do better. And there are perhaps NGOs that could do better than what they are doing today. Everyone is really accountable. This has to be built, and as you heard from uh, the previous presentation of uh, Dr. Kazaeva, WHO has been in charge of putting this together, but now it needs to be implemented. Finally, I want to just mention very quickly, there are bottlenecks, and I see two main bottlenecks. One is the political indifference. We published this in 2010, and what we said is essentially until there is a, a cultural revolution and UN agencies start really being serious about TB, making it a uh, priority, then nothing or very little, I would say, will accelerate. Uh, the same will apply to the World Bank. The same applies to UNICEF. The same applies to UNAIDS, to the governments that have special initiatives for HIV and malaria, to the industry. Everyone is responsible to accelerate. And we have political indifference uh, uh, in many of these, uh, uh, in many of these uh, agencies. I'm publishing this article that is going to be released, I believe tonight at midnight or so, uh, where I say in Lancet infectious diseases, no accountability, no results. It's difficult. The task of advocating for TB is difficult, but there are solutions to that. And that means accountability. That means if we have to build an observatory, let's build an observatory. But that's what, what is needed. And uh, finally, bottleneck number two, financial inadequacy. I've already discussed about it, so I'm not going to uh, go much longer than that. And uh, I want just to say, and to conclude by saying, after the UN General Assembly, the declaration was historical declaration, has been, in a way, even questioned. These are editorials in the Lancet or Lancet Infection Diseases. So one says a mischance. The other one says uh, the, uh, the UN General Assembly uh, meeting uh, dis disappointment. 
Now, these are part of the pessimistic views that prevail sometime in the uh, TB community as opposed to what I see around for other communities that are much more hopeful. I don't say optimistic because I'm, even a fool can be optimist. But you know, when you are hopeful, it means you have a real line, you have a real strategy to get somewhere. Is, are they true or are they not? I would very much like to uh, show that we can contradict this type of, uh, of opinions and get somewhere in the next few years. We have the tools, uh, even saving lives today. We have more investments perhaps coming, and that's where we should, uh, we should go to accelerate this decline. And I thank you all for having listened. If probably there are questions at this point, please ask me because, as I said, Shoba, I'm very sorry, but I will need to leave in the next 10, 15 minutes. Okay, just there will be one question, uh, Mario. And also, you are, uh, I think what you meant to say was that there has to be action which matches rhetoric. Rhetoric is not enough. Like just saying that uh, we will end TB, but there has to be action which has to match it at the ground level. Uh, and we have a question from one of our uh, um, health fellows, CNS health fellows, Moifo Porsia Murdi, who wants to know how long does it take to put someone who tested positive uh, for MDR TB on treatment? If there is well, a client, yes. That, that is a very challenging question because what we know is that only a quarter of the MDR TB cases in the world are diagnosed today and are put on treatment that is uh, the proper, appropriate treatment. Uh, the th the th three quarters of them are in fact never diagnosed. And that is again an issue of a health system. We have actually the tool to diagnose. We can use expert. Expert within literally two, three hours gives you the diagnosis of TB, gives you the diagnosis of multi over pumping resistance, which means you have to treat it in different ways. But if expert is not fully uh, uh, rolled out in a country, then we will always have a problem. So there are cases that are never diagnosed. It's not a matter even of a delay in diagnosis. There are cases, three quarters, never diagnosed. Therefore, never treated in an appropriate way. 25% of the world TB cases with uh, multidrug resistance are diagnosed, and the vast majority of them nowadays put on treatment. There is still a gap there even, because in some countries there is a waiting list. So you are diagnosed now because you have the tool, and then they tell you we don't have the drugs because we are missing one or two of these fairly sometime expensive or rare drugs, but that are available in systems yeah. that want to make them available. So this is the whole issue here, is the political commitment and the financial resources. Majority mm -hmm. of these, as I say, are never diagnosed. Mm -hmm. That are diagnosed sometime, you know, are diagnosed months later. And that is far too, uh, too bad in terms of saving lives and, and, uh, and uh, avoiding suffering. Okay, we have, we have one more question, Mario, uh, from Zafar. Uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, Zafar wants to know, is, is thanking you for a very honest presentation mm -hmm. and he hopes that people struggling to bend the curve uh, will actually progress. But are there other programs addressing risk factors of TB matching up the pace? Because it has to be a multi-sectoral approach. Yeah, I think this is the largest uh, or the biggest, I should say, challenge that uh, that has to be faced. You know, um, um, fortunately or unfortunately, depends on how you see it, the health sector is engaged uh, fully and uh, not entirely in every part of the world, but unfortunately, other sectors are not. And uh, this is what I was saying, and I will repeat again in this uh, editorial uh, that will come out in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, where I say, where is the accountability for these other sectors? There are uh, UN agencies, for instance, that are responsible for certain uh, uh, determinants, risk factors for tuberculosis. If you think about, I don't know, people living in slums, if you think about nutrition, these are all sectors that are crucially influential in, the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in determining less or more tuberculosis. So are they accountable? Have they done anything special? And the answer, when I look around, is unfortunately not. I have not seen, I have not seen so far any of these UN agencies saying TB is also my priority. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. As a matter of fact, no UN agency has ever put tuberculosis as the top priority. One more question for you, Mario, uh, from uh, Jean Perez Zellweger. Uh, great presentation. And can you please highlight some errors which should be corrected in order to accelerate the decline? 
Well, you know, there are technical issues, obviously, there, and that means that countries have to uh, fully adopt uh, uh, what I still consider the best possible strategy, obviously, because I was involved with, with putting it together, that is the NTP strategy. NTP strategy is very comprehensive. It includes elements you need to have. The patient-centered care, the uh, reforms in the health system to make, say, universal access and social protection available to everyone and research. So these elements are, are there and they are the top priorities within each of them. There are the details of what needs to be done. And, you know, for instance, if you ask me, I, I would put experts nowadays everywhere. They have nothing to do with the industry anymore, but, uh, you know, and even before it was even less having to do with industry. But it's not an issue of industry here. It's an issue that we have the best possible tool and that should be available until there is something better than that. Uh, so these are the, the priorities. You make the diagnosis, you make drug resistant diagnosis, and then you treat. And this is the, the number one thing to do. Second one is obviously latent infection. Not many countries are implementing, you know, wide scale prophylaxis type of programs, and that has to be corrected. But then there are other issues. These are the technical one, if you like, in the health sector. There are other issues that uh, need to be corrected. That is, once again, the engagement of all these other which, in my view, starts only, can only start at the level of the UN General Assembly. And that's why probably the Lancet and others have criticized and said uh, little has happened, is a failure, and this and the other. Because uh, the, the, what has not been seen is some of these influential agencies coming up and saying, we are going to tackle it, we are going to contribute with, say, correction of malnutrition in certain populations, and so on and so forth. So there are several action points that depend on health, in the health sector and some other that uh, do not depend on health. And that's why the, the highest level of accountability cannot be anything else than a UN General Assembly, or if you like, even a World Bank, a World Bank finance minister meeting where tuberculosis is brought there and say, what are we going to do to fight against the number one killer in the world? One last question it has come in just now, Mario. Uh, are generic medicines as good as the original ones? I didn't hear. Are generic medicines as ah, medicines. Yes, yes. Are generic medicines as good as the original ones? Portia wants to ask. Well, that. it's a difficult question once again because generic medicine is everything, and so you have a spectrum there of generic uh, drugs which are quality controlled and therefore efficacious and effective, and there are clearly uh, uh, generic products that have been found in the past when there was even an analysis done about them, uh, not uh, uh, really uh, up to the standard. So the risk there is that unless these are quality controlled by stringent, I would say, uh, 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 regulatory authorities, the risk always exists that you are giving a fixed dose combination where you think there are four drugs, and as a matter of fact, there are only one or two because the others are, for instance, not bioavailable, meaning rifampicin, for instance, suffers very much out of combining the drug. And unless you do it under you know, uh, rigorous uh, procedures, you may end up having a fixed dose combination that doesn't have rifampicin. And by doing so, not only you reduce the chance of curing people, but you are also favoring the development of drug resistance because you think you are giving three, four drugs, and the fact that you may be giving one or two only which means drug resistance besides treatment failure. So it, one has to be very careful. And this is, again, in a way, an appeal to governments to make sure that the drugs they put on sale, they allow to be on sale in uh, all these countries, are, in fact, of quality. Because if not, then we are shooting in our own feet. We think we are, and we are not. Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you for your time, for squeezing in time for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very important to talk about TB. Thank you all. Uh, and congratulations. So congratulations to those like, uh, like uh, uh, Prabha Mahesh that are activists and they fight mm -hmm. for the, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the necessary advocacy that we need in a country. And I don't see uh, in, uh, in the connection now the India National Program that obviously has done remarkably well, but now I think it's the time also in India to accelerate further. And I'm pretty sure that that will be addressed. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. From the global scenario, we now shift the focus to India, which we just saw sits at the peak of the TB epidemic. 
Uh, recently, Peter Sands, executive director at the Global Fund to Fight Tuberculosis, AIDS, and Malaria, had said that if the global fight against AIDS, TB, and malaria is going to be won, it has to be won in India. I now welcome our next speaker, Dr. V.S. Salhotra, who is Additional Deputy Director General at the Central TB Division in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. He has been working for tuberculosis for more than 15 years. Uh, just to let all of you know, Dr. Salhotra graciously consented to step in the place of Dr. K. S. Sajdeva, head of India's national TB program, who is unable to be with us today on the panel due to being called very last minute by the ministry for some urgent work. Thank you, Dr. Salhotra, for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Salhotra, India has promised to end TB by 2025. But the rate at which it is the TB uh, decline rate is current rate is 1.7%, which is much below the required rate of 5% by 2020 and 10% by 2025. Can you share with us where India stands currently in terms of reducing TB infections? Mario had just said that India will eliminate it by 21, 24 at the current rate. So what actions are being taken at the country level and local level bend the TB decline curve sharply enough? Over to you. Thanks, Shobha. Thanks for the introduction. After hearing uh, about the global perspective, uh, about what is what should be done? Uh, are we moving to what India has been doing and where we see uh, ourselves progressing towards uh, when uh, we come to ending tuberculosis? So I'll uh, try to share my yes. screen here. Uh, are you able to see? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, yeah. Coming to the uh, burden, I won't go into the details, but everyone knows that uh, India is a very high burden uh, country. We are in the incidence of tuberculosis, 2.7 million. And uh, Mario talked about the MDRTB cases. Uh, that also is very high in India. We have about 135,000 cases of MDRTB occurring every year. However, the good point is that uh, we had conducted our national drug dosing survey, wherein we had found that uh, the new cases, the prevalence of drug resistance, MDR, it is 2.8%, and in the previously treated cases, it is about 11.6%. And we have plans to have the national TB prevalence provide us the estimates for uh, <clears throat> state-wise uh, uh, burden of the disease uh, in our country. Uh, <clears throat> coming to the political uh, commitment, it was in on the 13th March last year in the NTB summit, wherein our uh, Honorable Prime Minister uh, gave a commitment to end uh, to meet the targets of uh, SDG for 2035 years ahead of the goal, that is in 2025. And uh, <clears throat> with that commitment, we have started moving forward and we had uh, a plan. Keeping in mind that we will be uh, meeting the targets of NTB by 2025. So with that in mind, we have prepared our national study plan which is based on the strategy of detect, treat, prevent, and build. And uh, there are different components which uh, try to address the TB in not only in the private sector, but also at the community level through different approaches. I don't want, because of paucity of time, I won't go into the details, but one important thing which is here that you can <clears throat> see that the funding on tuberculosis, it has been increased from 2017-18 to 2019-20 by more than 75%. That is a, a big uh, achievement in terms of commitment uh, to do to have the activities towards ending TB. Uh, here you can see, as you have uh, very correctly mentioned, 
that the decline that we want to see is not enough as of now. Uh, what we want to reach in uh, 2050 are uh, um, cases per 100,000, but 217 per 100,000. Uh, and what we, where we want to reach by 2025 20, is 44 cases per 100,000. And mortality we did want to reduce from 36 in 2015 to 3 in uh, 2025. So that is a big jump that we want to achieve. And uh, for that, what we are doing is that we are expanding the all uh, state of the art uh, diagnostics in the country. Uh, we have more than 16,000 uh, microscopy centers, about 1180 experts. We have uh, the indigenous technology, which is uh, almost similar to the uh, results that is that are provided by expert that is called TUNAC. And also, we have a bunch of culture and DST laboratories which are providing the services for drug resistant TB cases. And uh, <clears throat> what you can see here in the slide is in the year 2018, we had um, notified. 2.15 million cases a year, which is a key increase compared to the last year. And uh, this is a big achievement. And uh, through the active case finding, we could also diagnose 344 million population and diagnose close to 50,000 cases. So on the earlier uh, way of implementing the program through which we for him, uh, using the passive case finding at the health facilities, move towards the in intensified finding in HV, HIV care settings, diabetic clinics, uh, NRCs, and other uh, vulnerable populations to, towards the active case finding. So we are combining all the strategies together to diagnose maximum number of cases. And hope towards that, we have launched a project with the support of the global fund called G, which is implemented in 45 large cities and 348 districts. And uh, in the last year, the G, not only with the effort of the G, but also with the effort of the program um, by having collaboration with the private sector, we could uh, notify more than 500,000 cases which was a 35% increase in the notifications from the com private se sector compared to the previous year, that is 2017. So uh, <clears throat> we are making a big dent in terms of uh, case notifications from the private sector as well. The, uh, to provide uh, patient-friendly services, on the treatment part, what we are doing is we are moving towards injection free regimen. Close to 550,000 patients, they have been made free of injections. That is, for previously treated cases, we just uh, <clears throat> scaled up our strategy to provide them injection free regimen. So the IL monopoly in cases, we, the regimen is injection free. Uh, we are soon going to launch the all oral regimen which will be provided to close to 31,000 cases and about 40,000 40, patients would still be on injectable containing regimen. So uh, we have made significant effort to make the treatment uh, patient friendly. Uh, then we are also using the digital interventions. There are different interventions like Nixie's Park, the e Oshadi, or we call it Nixie Oshadi. There is TB NAT for which uh, results are provided directly to the to the facilities which are sending the samples. Uh, there are different technologies like 99 dots and mount. And uh, we are also uh, we have also started providing uh, incentives to the patients to provide nutritional support. A budget of about 600 crores has been uh, provided to the program to provide about uh, $7 per month to take care of the nutrition for the patient. 
and uh, more than 35 million dollars us dollars have al already been disbursed to the patients um, uh, starting last last till date so in terms of providing uh, good services or providing taking care of the nutrition and also taking care of the <coughs> catastrophic expenditure for the patient uh, the program is doing uh, is making significant contributions all the treatment and diagnostic facilities are available for the patients free of cost <coughs> on the pre prevention front we are implementing we have the guidelines we are implementing about infection control measures we have infection we have contact investigations in place we are providing uh, uh, preventive treatment to hiv infected and uh, children and we are expanding the scope of uh, uh, preventive treatment to adults and adolescents that will will soon be uh, scaled up and we are also addressing the determinants social determinants of disease by having uh, multi sectoral co uh, coordination having uh, 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 collaboration with the other ministries home affairs defense finance labor panchayati raj etc um, we have found that in the hiv program there was a uh, good collaboration developed uh, with the other ministries which we are taking forward on the same lines and, uh, we are also involving the community in a big way and we have uh, developed so since last year the national forum the state level forums the district level forums where the tb patients and the civil society they are on board to uh, not only to uh, for them uh, creating demand amongst the communities but also uh, ensuring that the good services are provided to the patient in, in addition the uh, overarching ayushman bharat program wherein uh, services are provided uh, through the primary level uh, through health and wellness centers and also at the secondary and tertiary care centers where more than 500 million people are getting the services free of cost which is a big boost for the not only for the health sector but also for the tb program to provide services to the patients uh, the way forward we have um, monitoring monitoring in place um, the activities are being planned at different levels starting from the block district state and the nas national level where all the plans are amalgamated and uh, finalized and through the community driven approaches we are also encouraging the panchayati raj institutions where wherein the people's representatives are there to ensure that we have tb free panchayats tb free blocks districts state and later when, when we uh, have done significantly well we'll be able to have tb free india um, the challenges are there we are trying to meet the challenges we are trying to bend the curve there is significant increase in our activities and we are trying to bend the curve so that we are able to meet the end tv targets um, by 2025 uh, <clears throat> that's it from me um, the presentation thank you for the patient listening and uh, uh, everyone uh, who's about, uh, they are welcome to ask questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salotra. Uh, we will have the questions uh, at the end in the question and answer session, so please stay on. And uh, you have said that climbing up is an, uh, climbing down is an uphill task. <laughs> Very well said, but we have to do it somehow. Uh, and also, uh, you mentioned the joint effort for elimination of TB. Uh, the acronym is JEET. And just for the benefit of the listeners, in Hindi language, Jeet also means victory. I think that is from where you, <laughs> you had that uh, very apt acronym. Well, there can be nothing for us without us. Community voices are central to TB control, or so do we firmly believe. Our next speaker is Prabha Mahesh. Prabha, can you tell where are we fed what needs done early on the chain of TB transmission to bend the curve? That is what we all are aiming at. Yes, Prabha. Yes. 
thank you so much for this opportunity and i i hope i do the real justice to the boys because i'm echoing on behalf of all the affected communities and uh, even the potential patients who are who have yet to experience this uh, at the onset i would just uh, bring to your uh, uh, attention that uh, see we've been talking about tuberculosis you know i have been representing various fora and also uh, meetings in which tb is seen more as a the approach to tuberculosis is more clinical so we are still talking about diagnostics treatment early case detection but what i feel is most important is we need to look at tuberculosis through a different lens altogether i think somewhere we need to work hard on the psychosocial aspects of the disease and uh, that is where uh, the community perspective comes into place so we've been talking about interventions research and uh, you know we're talking about advancement in technology and medicines diagnostics research but what is very important i feel is that a lot of investment has to go from the in the community front so who are the ones like who are the actual people who are right there in the community who are uh, working developing that micro planning so it is right uh, it's the front line workers and the volunteers and the community resources who i feel they are the nucleus actually in the whole intervention system uh, we have the private providers of course all of us know a huge chunk comes from the private providers and uh, we say that 49% of the tb population comes through the gateway of uh, private providers but what is very important here is the community resources so how much have we uh, even mapped the resources available in the community and uh, when we are saying community resources it includes the entire intervention with the system so it could it is also including the private providers public uh, facilities it is a network of all kinds of facilities that are available to every single patient uh one thing that really struck to me is like uh, we've been talking about access to uh, diagnostics as well as treatment but still what i have noticed is in spite of the okay recently i have been a part of the ppia implementation also where we have engaged the private sector and uh, made it available for the patient in the private facilities too but still what uh, the difference that i'm seeing is like stigma there is a lot to be done i think here is where the take is for the community like we have yet to work a lot on the stigma and discrimination i still have doctors telling me like though everything is freely available still the patient requires a lot of mental preparedness to experience this even to go in for a gene expert test uh, so again health seeking behavior the i feel that it is a responsibility of the community so how do we nurture this community so how do we work with these groups like uh, the right now what we have done is like we know we have done a mapping of communities in terms of like there are cbos there are ngos there are self help groups and there are so many networks available within the community but how do you work with them to that extent that you include tb into their agenda so many sensitization programs have happened in the community but what is it actually translated into we are still waiting for that expected outcome you know how we can involve the communities how we can engage in the communities right from creating awareness in the community so we are talking about a huge spectrum so we are going to include the media we have the uh, community resource resources health development sector we have the uh, response corporate responsibilities we have the donor we have the funding agencies it's a whole spectrum i'm talking about so how do we actually accelerate this so i think it we really require a robust response to npd unless we are able to establish systematic support of these stakeholders i'm talking about meaningful engagement of these uh, stakeholders and we shift our paradigm towards a community approach in the sense of working uh, defining and also designing uh, this designing a plan in terms of uh, program the program monitoring and implementation should be well uh, structured so to meet 
the community I mean to actually tap the community resources and ensure how we can make the best of, out of the community interventions like what can come out of this so uh, what i uh, i have been looking at is like we have always been working on strategies but i think the strategy that we require is some kind of a concrete action so i'm looking at the three levels of governance i feel there should be a kind of a close collaboration of these uh, stakeholders the stakeholders have been talking about in terms of private in terms of public sector and also there are a lot of uh, associations and uh, organizations representing the communities so i think we'll have to help uh, we'll have to involve them and uh, that has to be a meaningful engagement of the community civil societies organization and what is most important i feel is the bold uh, policies and support system so unless and until uh, we come together and set up yes infrastructures have been created so there is a lot of work that has gone in to ensure accessibility and availability of uh, facilities in terms of diagnosis and treatment but still there is a barrier right from the beginning as i talked about stigma discrimination the health seeking behavior and involving and understanding who are the key affected populations where do they come from and it requires a special kind of a boost as to how do we work in those kind of areas there are remote areas there are unreached areas that are difficult to reach and there is an entire key population again which is not very easy to be uh, you cannot access them also so easily and you have to really work with their attitudes alter their attitudes towards self seeking behavior and work towards the continuum of care right from cuff to cure and as i'm also since all of us discussed about the multidisciplinary and the multi sectoral approach i think this multidisciplinary in the multi disciplinary approach what is most important is there are lot of resources available in the community maybe the key affected population the affect uh, the uh, patients themselves See, they have the lived experiences i think that is where we need to encash upon so involving them right at the decision making level in the program planning monitoring and implementation and setting targets that is uh, most required right now so how do you involve them in the continuum of care because we are talking about reducing risk uh, risk reduction and also these kind of advocacies and exposure to uh i mean involving them in these kind of uh, media and policies and in advocacy in initiating i think they should be given this opportunity to initiate advocacy programs i'm not talking in terms of uh, some kind of an extreme activism in terms of not that kind it's not that uh, again even uh, making people understand you know the tb patient understanding their rights of course their responsibilities and how they need to take care of themselves during that entire uh, period till treatment so i think it has a lot to do because you are talking about counseling it's just not initiating uh, patients on the treatment but how do we sustain uh, the motivation of the patient till they complete adherence so that is where again stigma discrimination counseling family intervention community care all that are the main ingredients where we can influence and help uh, in getting the right outcome treatment outcomes from the patient themselves and what has been very interesting in my experience is that when we have been uh, uh, forming these uh, support groups you know patient networks i think that has to be really a lot of fund investment has to go into the capacity building of these groups like there are so many networks there are so many patient groups like uh, our friend was talking about the hiv scenario so a lot has gone into it it's just not talking about rights and uh, standing there and uh, uh, you know uh, making a demonstrations there it's nothing it's not only that but involving people understand making them understand that it is it's a part of their own responsibility to be a part of it so i think investment in terms of community uh, training and capacity building of the community based organizations and the ngos self help groups and involving them and acknowledging like they have to be accountability we talked about so they have to be 
made responsible for this continuum of care and uh, what again is very much required here is the lasting partnership access health and social sectors and between health sectors and also the communities we have to work towards developing the working groups in community as i said awareness a lot has to go still in awareness we are still looking at the at the uh, i mean in the, that kind of scenario where the community people will be the spokesperson they are the nucleus and they are they have uh, they can influence the uh, patient and also the other the patient and the communities in actually getting uh, what is dreamt of like in terms of like uh, Uh, what is very important in these community settings is there is always resource available but how do we tap these resources how do we align these resources in a way that could be contributing to the patient and the society as well and uh, framing effective uh, networking developing models and we need to widen the network of uh, facilities engaged in tb care and i think i again talked about the policy development planning and the periodic uh monitoring and program implementation and what is very important i feel to uh, ensure that these uh, representative groups like you know the uh, communities should be made to understand the budget cycle because they may just demand they may ask for rights but they should also be made uh, there should be some literacy to these uh, groups as to they should also be understanding the budget cycle and involve them in the entire program implementation plan so i think uh, what i would like to uh, talk about in terms of aggressive tb response like uh, there should be a strategic policy action definitely it has it should be initiated by a board leadership we need adequate financing which all of us talked about and innovative tb control we require a lot of innovations in the tb control we are talking about awareness we are talking about media we are talking about advocacy but i think a lot of innovation has to go into this and critical components of uh, tb the aggressive uh, tb response also includes incentive to the patient because what we have seen i think for the past few months that's a total game changer so how do we uh, we are talking about incentive to providers we are talking about incentives to the patients but i think even in the community setting uh, something can be worked out so that uh, i think uh, it could be a good reinforcement for the community as well to be a part of this uh, control uh, the tb control system thank and you uh, thank uh, you we are running out of time yes it is you can uh, just last the final line tb response without uh, its full integrated involvement of community will inevitably fall short but a national tb response that supplements and support the Com the complete engagement of community and the key affected population will only ensure a fine status thank you very much thank you for a very good presentation we now open the question and answer session we already have a lot many questions pouring in and uh, we are very happy to have as uh, amongst the participants dr rajesh kumar sood who is district tb officer kangra himachal pradesh uh, and he has been doing yeoman work there uh, dr sood would you like to ask your question yourself yes if he, yes dr sood would you like uh, to speak yourself uh, am i audible yes very audible yes well the indian tb program has increased the financing but most of the increase in financing has just gone to the nutritional support scheme uh, we need increased financing in the other components also dr salotra would you like to say something yes 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 <clears throat> uh it is a very pertinent question there it appears as i indicated in my slide uh, that the funding for uh nutrition has been set aside but that doesn't mean that the increased funding is not going to other areas we have been investing in scale up of the diagnostics we have, uh, I have in my presentation i showed that the diagnostics have been expanded and uh, in addition uh, we are going to expand it further 
we are going to use the state of art technologies like expert we are going to scale up the use of expert and also the two net which is an indigenous technology so that it can be taken uh, towards the patient so that the patients don't have to travel much in addition we are investing in improving the treatment strategies uh, by using the newer drugs for uh, drug resistant tb patients like bedaquiline and dilamanet they have become um, part of our guidelines and uh, as i mentioned about the all oral regimen bedaquiline will be a, an integral component apart from the other drugs uh, <clears throat> for uh, giving all oral regimen to the mdr tb patients we are also scaling up different interventions at different levels like be it ecsm be it uh, uh, increasing the focus on the pediatric tb be it on the latent tb all the uh, components of the program are getting the increased investments um, there may be some areas in which uh, the effort has been decent and uh, investment may not be acquiring uh, uh, increasing but uh, there is a lot of increase in the investments in different activities uh, which you will be seeing in future uh, thank you i would just like to add here that uh, dr sood has uh, ensured uh, engaging social actors for water provisions to provide safe water for eating medicines at each dot center in his district so today is world water day also i think that becomes very pertinent in that context uh, we have also in the amongst the participants subrat mohanty from the union uh, subrat would you like to speak out your comment he has made a comment subrat would you like to say it yourself yes subrat uh maybe he is not there uh, subrat said that the national tb program in india is making much headway and with participation of civil society organizations and tb champions we can achieve the ambitious target of ending tb by 2025 involve and engage civil societies and tb champions so a big clap to our two panelists who are still present who are there uh, dr salhotra i have a question for you Uh, in 2015 india published the largest ever study with 150000 patients proving why doing upfront dst using gene expert increases tb case detection plus diagnosis of drug susceptibility to rifampicin india has gene expert in every district uh, when are we going to do universal dst that is one question yeah sure but before you go to the second one which i may forget yes I must reply to this one yes uh, <clears throat> universal dst has been in, in uh, implementation since the last 2 years all the diagnosed patients for whom so ever the sample is available uh, the patient has to be subjected to uh, gene expert or lpa testing so based on the uh, resistance pattern or the drug susceptibility pattern the patient will undergo further investigations for example if the patient through gene expert even though he might have been initiated on the first line treatment if he is found to be um, rifampicin resistant then uh, he is subjected to further investigations like second line lpa uh, so that he can get appropriate treatment regimen and if the patient is found to be rifampicin sensitive then we do uh, first line lpa which tells us about the resistance to imh which uh, leads to the patient being provided a regimen for h mono or poly drug resistant tb so the this is being scaled up universal dst we have reached about 40% 40% our benchmark is 70% of the patients would be getting uh, universal dst we have reached 40% and we uh, expect that in the current year itself we will be able to reach close to 70% because uh, this universal dst will be, would be able to do only for the patients for whom the sample is available okay uh, the, the second, second question, question is about latent tb uh, kerala is one state Which has uh, suddenly uh, committed to not recently 
committed to eliminate latent TB, which I think is very important to end. Uh, are other states going to follow the example of Kerala? Yeah, uh, the other states are being encouraged to adopt the strategy of ending TB by 2025. Some states have come forward that we want to end TB even before that, and Himachal Pradesh is one of them. And uh, they, one of the important strategies there would be to tackle the latent TB, for which the program has uh, itself started uh, making efforts. Although currently the uh, IPT is available for HIV infected and children, but uh, we recently have taken decision to uh, scale it up for adults and ad adolescents as well. And not only that, uh, <clears throat> the best possible uh, preventive treatment through mm -hmm. use of rifabentin. We had uh, got in touch with the supplier of rifabentin and got them engaged with the uh, drug controller so that the drug is uh, registered in country. And these regimen, including rifapentin and INH, which is a 12 dose, uh, weekly dose uh, regimen, which uh, will also be available for uh, management of latent TB. That uh, we, it is there in our um, plans and we are going to scale it up. Okay. That's yes. very encouraging news. Uh, Raman, there's a question for you. Uh, do you think women need to be involved more in the TB control activities as patients, by way of patients and activities both? You are not clear. Please, can you come again? What, what about the role, role, of role of women? Role of the women? In women, women. yes, yes. So, women in control. are they being disproportionately affected by TB or are they at more of the receiving end? Uh, see, what I have noticed is uh, right now I'm working with various corporations and even across the states. Uh, so, it's not that uh, the discrepancy, I mean, the proportion between men and women is very different because what I've seen is there are some states in which, yes, you have more of women TB patients and in some, uh, even in some geographies, it depends on the geography. There are some uh, ge uh, stark differences in certain geographies where you have more of uh, men who are TB patients. But uh, what, uh, I'm, uh, what I'm seeing is like, yes, if you see the overall scenario, there can be a slight difference, but it's not a very huge difference. Because earlier we had uh, typically people from the productive age group. But now what I'm seeing is from the much, much younger generation. Actually, TB patients uh, from that group. Uh, but uh, as far as women are concerned, earlier I would say uh, I've been working for the past 15 years in uh, TB control. So initially there was a very stark difference because uh, we didn't have that many women who would voluntarily come for, uh, you know, for a checkup. So they would not want to have a voluntary checkup just because of the awareness, uh, because they don't have the access to newspapers like the other men have, and also they don't have, they didn't have uh, much uh, knowledge about nutrition immune system. So a lot of work went in these community areas where we had uh, uh, conducted health education for women, and I would say that compared to what it was before, the exposure is much much more in women these days. Uh, yes, but it does take time for them to actually come out in the open and get tested. It's not because of the knowledge and awareness, but as you know, the typical Indian women, the cultural context is such like they have the other priorities at home rather than their own health need. So that is the reason why gen generally there is the delay in getting diagnosed. Thank, Thank you. you. We have already overshot the time. We now come to the close of the webinar. My sincere thanks to all the panelists for a very enriching discussion. We are grateful to the participants for their engagement with the webinar and special thanks to our guest met moderator, Ashok Kamskyo. The webinar was streamed live on CNS Facebook page and YouTube. And the link to the webinar recording and for will be shared with all the participants. Thanks and have a restful weekend.
Bye-bye.